This past Saturday, Iran launched hundreds of ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones at targets inside Israel in what I would characterize as a failed attempt at kinetic diplomacy. Kinetic diplomacy meaning a military action meant to send a significant message without necessarily resulting in open war. And I say it was a failure because we now know that some 99% of all the weapons launched were either intercepted or failed on their own before reaching Israeli territory. In fact, it now looks like as much as half of the weapons Iran launched actually failed due to technical problems before anybody even had a chance to shoot them down. But despite the poor performance of Iran's weapons, some have still tried to characterize Saturday night's attack as a victory for Iran in a war of financial attrition. In other words, Iran didn't spend very much money on the weapons they launched, but they forced Israel and Israel's partner nations to spend a great deal of money on the interceptors they used to defend against those inexpensive weapons. And there is at least some truth to that. It's entirely possible that Israel and its partner nations spent 10 times the amount of money Iran spent on Saturday night. But despite that, Saturday night's attack was still very much a losing proposition for Iran. So let's talk about why. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Firepower. Before we dive in, let's take a minute to talk about today's sponsor. Ground news. When people talk about bias in media, they usually talk about dishonest reporting. But the truth is, the most pervasive kinds of bias in most media today comes in the form of semantic framing. Now, semantic framing is the use of intentional word choices to shape perceptions of a story. And Ground News makes it very easy to spot this sort of trickery. Ground News is an aggregator that collects news stories from outlets all around the world and then places them into an easy to follow feed that makes it really simple to see the differences in coverage depending on an outlet's political bias. Remember our discussion about Russia's efforts to field an orbital nuke? Well, here on Ground News, we can see that 212 news outlets have already covered the story, including 44 left-leaning outlets, 27 right-leaning outlets, and 88 centrist outlets. But what's particularly interesting to me is the differences in semantic framing you can see in the headlines between left and right-leaning outlets. Left-leaning outlets repeatedly used words like troubling in their headlines to emphasize the implications of this announcement, whereas right-leaning outlets used terms like disturbing or sparks chaos to emphasize reactions to the announcement over implications. Neither side's headlines were dishonest, but they're certainly framed differently thanks to very specific word choices. And Ground News makes it very easy to identify these kinds of tough-to-spot biases by putting these stories right next to one another. Ground News is an invaluable part of my research toolbox, and it can be in yours too. Make sure to go to ground.news slash sandbox to get 40% off unlimited access to the same vantage plan that I use in my research. Subscribing not only supports my channel, but it supports the work of the folks at Ground News who are working hard to hold media accountable. I know I find Ground News to be useful, and I think you will too. Let's take a minute to talk about the comparative cost of kinetic action, which, as a graduate school way of saying, the cost of waging war. Over the weekend, we saw Iran launch some 300, or maybe as many as 330, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and suicide drones at targets inside Israel. And then we saw around 99% of those weapons intercepted before they could make landfall inside Israeli territory. Now, as I explained in a video yesterday, it doesn't appear that Iran was trying to score some massive strategic victory in this strike. But it's also safe to say that they weren't planning on being embarrassed either, with as few as maybe just seven weapons actually making it to Israeli territory, and none of them having any real strategic impact at all. Objectively speaking, there's really no way to characterize what happened on Saturday night as anything other than a victory for the U.S.-led coalition of some eight nations, five of which actually mounted intercept efforts of their own using their own defensive assets. But that hasn't stopped some from working tirelessly to find a silver lining for Iran. 
with some now claiming that despite Iran's failure to actually find any targets in Israel, they nonetheless scored a significant financial victory over the Israeli government and its politically aligned partner nations. Now, the idea behind this financial victory narrative all comes down to something that we usually call the cost exchange ratio. Now, the cost exchange ratio is a comparison of the cost of the weapon launched at you and the interceptor you use to shoot it down. And truth be told, interceptors are almost always significantly more expensive than the missiles that they shoot down. That's just the nature of warfare. It's a lot cheaper to build a missile that can take off from the ground and then find the ground again than it is to build a missile that can take off from the ground and then find another missile in the air, sometimes traveling at extremely high speeds. You could say it's like trying to hit a bullet with a bullet, except these missiles sometimes travel faster than bullets. And that actually brings up a point that I should clarify for those who aren't familiar with missile defense. The best way to shoot down an inbound missile is, more often than not, with another missile. Except the missile that you launch, commonly called an interceptor, needs to be significantly more advanced in order to find that missile as it closes with targets inside your territory. Now, as a general rule of thumb, we usually assess that the cost of an interceptor is, on average, about twice the cost of the weapon intercepted. But that average does not always hold true. In fact, some of the U.S. Navy's SM-3 ballistic missile interceptors ring in at north of $11 million apiece, whereas the missiles they intercept may cost less than a million dollars. But, and there is always a but, Many of the cruise missiles and drones launched by Iran on Saturday night were not shot down by U.S. Navy interceptors, but were rather taken down by airborne aircraft using infrared-guided air-to-air missiles. And those often ring in at less than a half a million dollars apiece, sometimes way less. And as a result, we may actually see the overall cost exchange ratio shake out to that average two to one. But the truth is, the cost exchange ratio could have been much worse than that this weekend. It may have been as high as 4 to 1, or 5 to 1, or even worse. And that's why a lot of people are saying that this represents a financial victory for Iran. If Iran spent, let's say, $1 million and forced the coalition to spend $2 million, or $4 million, or $10 million to shoot down those weapons, well, then you could see this as a victory in the war of financial attrition, which is a legitimate concern in prolonged conflict when two nations are at war with one another for an extended period of time. Now, when that kind of prolonged war, wearing down a nation's buying power or the money they have on hand can have a huge impact on the outcome of the conflict. But in this sort of situation, where we're talking about tit-for-tat military actions that are more kinetic diplomacy than they are acts of open war, it's not nearly as much of a consideration. Ultimately, as long as war isn't declared between all these nations in the next six months or so, well then, discussions about financial attrition are strictly academic. With a long enough timeline between military actions, these nations will all simply refill their financial and military stores. This stuff seems complicated when we speak in geopolitical terms, but if you think of it in terms of just individual people, it gets a lot easier to grasp. Think of it this way, if two people are at war with one another and one is trying to win through financial attrition, well then they need their opponent to be emptying their bank vault faster than they are refilling it. Which means you need multiple consecutive military engagements with a bad cost exchange ratio for that adversary spread out over a prolonged period of time. Because if you spread those battles out, well, your opponent has the opportunity to refill that bank vault. And there is a laundry list of other reasons why that cost exchange ratio, comparing the cost of interceptor versus the cost of weapon intercepted, is a handy tool for analysts to compare the efficacy of defensive assets, but a terrible way to measure the success or failure of an engagement. You see, the cost exchange ratio is meant to be one metric of many that you use to look at the big picture. It is definitely not meant to be looked at in isolation. And just some of the reasons why include how that cost exchange ratio comparing interceptor to weapon does not consider the cost of defended assets that could have been destroyed had that weapon made it through. It also doesn't consider the cost of the weapon or the interceptor as a percentage of a nation's gross domestic product or overall buying power or as a percentage of their defense expenditures or how much they spend on defense each year. 
It doesn't consider respective nations' resupply capacity or the stockpile of weapons they have in theater and their ability to replenish them, which includes producing more. It doesn't consider logistical constraints or costs in theater either, which include whether or not an interceptor is launched from an aircraft that can be rearmed in a day or from a U.S. Navy warship that will need to sail out of theater in order to have new interceptors loaded into its VLS tubes. Likewise for Iran, it doesn't consider the cost of mobilizing its forces, relocating weapons, the logistical constraints not just on moving these weapons to where they need to be, but moving the personnel to where they need to be to operate it and then supporting those personnel throughout the extent of the combat operation. All of these are costs Iran wouldn't have seen had they not mounted this offensive. And maybe the biggest blind spot when trying to use this cost exchange ratio to portray Saturday night's attack as an Iranian victory is the fact that Israel did not foot the bill of defense alone, and neither did the United States. In fact, it was split very much between five nations and maybe as many as eight. Now, we don't actually know what a lot of these variables are, and I would argue that most people wouldn't unless they're a part of a nation's intelligence apparatus or maybe a military planner. But by using the data that we do have, we can do some quick and dirty back-of-the-envelope math to see in broad numbers that no matter how you look at it, Saturday night's attack was a losing financial proposition for Iran. So let's dive into the numbers and see just how bad this was for Iran. But disclaimer up front, it can be very difficult to find reliable figures for what Iran spends on its weapon systems. So we're going to use widely reported figures and then err in Iran's favor to give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, according to multiple media reports, including Iranian state television, Iran launched some 330 munitions at Israel on Saturday night, including some 30 cruise missiles, seemingly Cuds 1 and Pave missiles, which all ring in at around 2 to $2.1 million a piece. Now, these are hands down the most expensive weapons Iran launched on Saturday night. They also launched some 180 Shahed drones, which range in cost from around $50,000 a piece to as high as maybe $160,000. And finally, another 120 ballistic missiles at, let's say, $100,000 a pop for another $12 million. Now, altogether, that comes out to $81 million in munitions expended on Saturday night's attack. But again, let's give Iran the benefit of the doubt and say it was much cheaper than that and cut it down to just $50 million. Now, Iran's annual gross domestic product, or GDP, is right around $413 billion. And in 2023, Iran increased its defense budget by about 11% year over year, up to $24.6 billion. So if Iran launched $50 million worth of missiles and drones on Saturday night, that singular attack represents about 0.01% of the nation's overall GDP and about 0.2% of the nation's defense budget for the entire year. Now let's compare that to defending nations to see how big of a financial hit they took. Now the United States has an annual gross domestic product, or GDP, of about $25.44 trillion. That's 61 times larger than Iran's economy. And America's defense budget for this year was $842 billion, which in itself is about 34 times the size of Iran's defense budget. Israel's GDP is about $525 billion, with about $24.3 billion allocated to defense. Jordan's GDP is about $48.65 billion, with about $2 billion allocated to defense. France's GDP is $2.779 trillion, with about $42.8 billion allocated to defense. And the UK's GDP is about $3.332 trillion, with about $68 billion allocated to defense. And that means of just the five nations actually physically intercepting weapons on Saturday night, they have a combined GDP of about $32.12 trillion per year and a combined defense expenditure of about $979 billion. Now, in order to come up with a reasonable estimate for the cost of the defensive effort, we're going to look to two different sources, one within Israel and one from outside it. According to the Institute for National Security Studies out of Tel Aviv, Israel's defense on Saturday night cost between $500 and $550 million. 
But according to news outlets like The New Arab, which is Qatari-owned but London-based and in the past has accused Western media of exhibiting a pro-Israeli bias, the actual cost of Israel's defense on Saturday night may have been as high as a billion dollars. But to tell you the truth, it doesn't matter which of these figures you use. When it comes to comparative cost, Iran still comes up on the losing end. If the five defending nations spent $500 million on ordinance on Saturday night, that would represent about 0.0016% of their collective GDP, and about 0.05% of their collective defense budget for the year. That means that as a percentage of sheer purchasing power, Iran spent about seven and a half times as much as the defending nations did. And in terms of defense expenditure, Iran spent about four times more. So let's turn to the bigger figure of $1 billion in defensive assets expended. Well, that would represent about 0.003% of the defending nation's combined GDP, or about 0.1% of their combined defense expenditure for the year. Now that would mean as a percentage of sheer purchasing power, Iran still spent about four times as much as the defending nations. And as a percentage of just defense expenditures alone, Iran still spent about twice as much. So what does this all actually mean? Well, it means that the simple comparison of the cost of a weapon versus the cost of the interceptor meant to shoot it down does have some practical value in policy analysis and establishing warfare doctrine. But as a measure of the success of an individual engagement, it is a wildly inaccurate tool absent a great deal of broader context. In fact, even the figures that I just used would probably be a fairly inaccurate representation of how this cost actually breaks down to each individual nation. And that really matters. Financial attrition is certainly an important consideration in long-term conflict and is very much worthy of analysis. But financial attrition is not simply a measure of dollars spent versus dollars spent, but rather resources expended as a percentage of a whole compared to resources expended as a percentage of a whole. There is no arguing that a billion dollars is a whole bunch of money. But at the end of the day, a billion dollar pie slice out of a $32 trillion pie is just smaller as a percentage than a $50 million pie slice out of a $400 billion pie. And that's why if we're going to compare pie slices, we have to compare the pies they're cut out of as well. Because context may not fit in a headline or in a tweet, but it still matters. Regardless of how you or anyone feels about Israel or its sitting government or the nations providing military support during attacks like these, it doesn't change the fact that Saturday night's attack was a financial failure for Iran. But as for whether or not it was a strategic success is yet to be determined, because ultimately we don't know what Iran's strategic objectives are. If their goal was to save face while maintaining the status quo and flexing some military might, well, it wasn't that successful a demonstration, but it may arguably still be successful if war doesn't ultimately break out between these two nations. But if Iran's long-term goal is open war with Israel, well then, Saturday night's attack was a strategic loss as well. And the one thing that we on the outside looking in can take away from this attack in an analytical sense is an understanding that measuring success or failure in any military operation is almost never as simple as just comparing dollars spent. I know the internet hates nuance and hates context maybe even more, but if we want to understand the nature of conflict to do a better job of deterring it in the future, we need to learn to embrace complicated reality. 